I told you uh, last time, and even really the time before, you know, since a week ago, I was saying here, uh, no new physics. Uh, we're just going to keep applying what we already uh, have learned. And so that's what chapter 12 is. And so I really like chapter 12. Very short chapter. Uh, can get a little involved with the calculation, so don't, don't belittle it by any means. Hopefully you're working on it or working towards getting there because your test is only five days away. A number of activities between now and your test. Obviously you have the lecture today which we're going to uh, talk about chapter 12, although as I said jokingly but seriously, we'll lecture here on chapter 12. It'll probably be no more than 10 minutes and then we'll do examples for the rest of the time period. I mean that's just the way chapter uh, 12 is. I'll show you in just a second. But that's for the rest of the day. Of course you have Friday with that uh, work session, that help session, and then an additional help session on Saturday. And so I wanted to make sure you uh, took note of that Saturday 1 to 4. So if you can uh, be here, I'm sure you will find it uh, well worth your, your time. All right, well, to chapter 12, and like I said, today is just really more examples. I think you will um, see that, and hopefully you'll find them uh, a little more settling than uh, what we did on Monday, now that you've got time for that to digest. That also, and I think the problems here in chapter 4 are really pretty, uh, I don't want to say easy, but easier than we saw in 11. In fact, you might be happy to hear we're on a little downward trend, if you will, as things begin to wrap up. Uh, we've got really just this chapter, which like I said, no new physics and even little easier problems than what we just saw. And uh, then we get into 13 and 14. Interesting stuff. Yes, there is some new physics there, but I think all of that is easier than the stuff we've been doing. I wouldn't call it easy stuff. I don't think anything that we do this semester is easy, although maybe looking back at chapter one, converting units, now that we're this far along, you may look back and go, yeah, that was easy. Okay, and maybe it wasn't then, but that was our our easy stuff here. Right? But you are going to see, like I said, a little easier stuff. So in some sense you can, you know, take your right hand, put it over your left shoulder, pat yourself on the back and say, okay, I've got through the hard stuff. Although kind of, you probably really are still in the middle of it getting ready for that big test on Monday here. But when you do get past that test, then you can pat yourself on your back and uh, maybe that will give you a big celebration for Thanksgiving. And uh, in case you have nothing else to be thankful for, you made it this far. But I'm sure you have many other things to be thankful for. All right. Well, with that said, then let's go here into chapter 12, where chapter 12 has the title of Static Equilibrium. And the name alone is really the whole lecture. I mean, what does this name mean? If somebody said static equilibrium, what would you think about this word static? <laughs> yeah, unchanging, not moving. How would you translate that into an equation and into a physics class? <laughs> okay, so you would say velocity equals zero and angular velocity equals zero. At least that's not what I'm hoping you're thinking, right? Static, not moving. So what we're really is we're talking about uh, a special cases of situations where what we want is we want an object not to, as you said, move. Now when I say move, that means translationally or rotationally. And so that's what we've been doing for these last few uh, chapters is been focusing on the rotational part. The translational part we've already been doing. And so this chapter puts that all together and says, you want to build a bridge. What do we want about that bridge? Static, right? We don't want the bridge to move. We don't want it to go up or down or left or right and we don't want it to spin either, okay? And so no rotations, no translations, we want it to be static. And so this is our meaning of static. Now, this word may not quite be as obvious, equilibrium. What would that say to you? Okay, balanced in the sense that not only is the translational velocity equal to zero, but it remains that way. See, it's not just an issue about is the velocity of the bridge zero, because you could throw a bridge up and when it gets to the top, what's the velocity of the bridge? Zero. Is that a good thing? No, that's still not a good thing, right? And we want this bridge to not only have a velocity of zero, but we want it to remain with a velocity of zero.
And so equilibrium means, as I heard somebody say, kind of a balance. Yes, a balance of the forces. They're letting the acceleration come out to be zero. So a bridge or a building is exactly that. In fact, we've got a whole class titled Static Equilibrium. Statics. It's Engineering 115. Many of you will be taking it. If you're in the civil engineering or mechanical engineering, I think you're required to do it. Uh, if you're electrical engineering, I depend on what school you transfer, but I was just helping a student look it up for UCSB. And it, it's not required, but maybe worth, you know, taking if it, you know, is, you know, a, an additional class. I, I think you'd find it interesting. And in fact, that's what I was trying to tell the student. They were asking about it. And they wanted to know if they should take it or not. And I said, well, yes, I think you'll find it interesting, but let's make sure you do these first. So we went to assist and I go, do all those on the assist. See these ones that say required? That's your first one. So he hadn't done those. So I said, do those first. Okay, so do these ones that are required. Then do the static. I don't know how I got off on that. Only to say that this is what you're going to be doing more in the future, depending on what your degree takes you to here, a static equilibrium. But next fall, many of you will be in our statics class, and the whole class, you know, you'll be saying, what's the velocity? Because you'll be talking about building bridges. Uh, in fact, the class, I don't know if you've seen some of the students around in our lab, there was a bunch of them yesterday in lab adjacent to ours, if you were watching them, and they were building a bridge. That was the whole uh, their homework assignment, their lab assignment, and they had to build a bridge and keep it from falling as they put on weights here. And then so they were trying to make sure that their velocity equal to zero and their angular velocity equal to zero even as you started piling weights on it. Well the second part of this then is also of an equilibrium is not only uh, do we want then it to be uh, in translational equilibrium but also in a rotational equilibrium and so yes the velocities translational and angular are zero but also the accelerations are equal to zero and that's really the key to this chapter it's right here how are you going to get acceleration equal to zero what does that mean about the sum of all the forces yeah the sum of all the forces have to come out to be zero and so if you are still able in your busy schedules to follow my original advice at the beginning of the semester and read the chapter before you come to the lecture first thing you would have saw last night as you were reading this is section one says first condition of static equilibrium the sum of the forces must equal zero because if it doesn't equal zero, then you know you have an acceleration. Which, as a little plug, I mentioned the statics class, or Engineering 115, many of you will be taking next fall. That would be followed in the spring by our dynamics class. What happens when the forces aren't equal to zero? And then things start to, to move. And so, you know, say you want to build a satellite. Well, you want it to move. You, you know, you want a different uh, scenario. So we got one whole class on th keeping things from not moving and a whole another class when they are moving. Uh, when you take it, you'll probably remember this, but every time I come back in January, I'm sure the same thing will happen this year too. The students go through this static equilibrium class all semester long. Some of the forces are zero, some of the forces are zero, some of the forces are zero. And they walk into the dynamics class in January and they go, oh, some of the forces equal, and they still want to say, Zero. So let me be this warning now, although you won't need it for another year, but it's very easy after spending a whole semester on this special case to forget it is a special case. But that's what this chapter is, is to introduce you to that special case. And so the sum of the forces would be zero. What would this one say? Yeah, the sum of the torques would be zero. And so that is what in the first section of chapter 12 says this is the second condition. So both of these have to be true at the same time. So what we will do is we will look at a particular problem and say is it in static equilibrium? If it is, then these two conditions must be true. And if these two conditions are true, we can write out the equations and so we'll have a system of equations and then we can solve for the unknown depending on what they're after. And that's the whole chapter in a, in, in a nutshell. I mean that is it completely. If you've got a chance to look through chapter 12, there's only four sections. The first section is this right there. Like I said, nothing new. We already knew that, but just emphasizing the same thing. The, the next section is just to remind you about center of mass. 
how to find the center of mass. Now we did that in chapter 11, I mean chapter 9, excuse me, the center of, of mass, but it really wasn't as powerful as we need it now. Why? Well, look at this. Let's say that I take, say, a beam and I put, you know, just for simplicity, a uniform beam here. And maybe I put it, oh, you know, on two little rocks, two little piles, two little mounds, you know, two little something. And I want to know something about the forces between the beam and this pile, and the beam and this pile. What I need to do is look at all the forces on them and all the torques. So obviously one of the force, wouldn't it be the weight of the object? But then also to do the torque, don't you have to know the distance or the position that that force is acting upon? And that's where the center of mass comes into play. So your author takes part two, and I think the best way for me to do part two is just start doing examples. Just saying, hey, remember what we did, center of mass? Well, that's why we care about it. And so that's what this little 10 minute lecture is. It's say, look, yes, this is true. And in part to get torques, you have to know that there is a mass. And where is that force acting? It's at its center of mass. So we got to know how to find the, the center of mass. We got to think about the, the center of mass. Anyway, so that's why your author kind of repeats center of mass in section two. And section three is really what I want to do today, is he just does examples. I think he's got seven examples he works out. And so I just want to do the same. I want to pick another seven examples here and see how far we get in these next two, uh, two hours and just do example after example after example. And, that, and that's it. That's the, the whole chapter and the whole lecture. Although I should point out, your author does take one more step um, in section four. He kind of introduces you to the structure of material. He says, now wait a minute. Um, if the force is being pushed on here, you might want to ask yourself, is the material it's being placed on, like if this is concrete or dirt, is this strong enough? Is this material itself strong enough to support it? And so not only do you want to calculate the forces, but then you want to know how those forces are affecting the material. Does the material break? Great questions, but for us, We'll stop there. We won't even deal with section four. We'll wait till next fall when you guys take your statics and your equilibrium and decide, you know, should I build this with concrete? Uh, should I build this with steel? Should I build it with aluminum, brass? Uh, you know, what is it? Uh, still reinforced concrete has some huge uh, uh, advantages. In fact, pre-stressed steel embedded in concrete. Some incredible advantages. And so you'll, you'll talk more about those. Uh, but he does have a couple of words and ideas in section four that I think are important. So without getting into the materials of the, the concrete and the steel, let me get some words out here because I do want you to see something very important as we do a problem. I'm going to start with a string. And even though I have a string, on a bigger scale, it could be a rope, fair enough? Or a bigger scale, it could be a cable, a steel cable, or a chain. But the key is, it's flexible. Okay, so here I have, in this case, some string. I'm going to make a little loop. And let's say I take this little loop and I, and I hook it onto something. I, I tie it on. Actually, maybe I'll just put it around here like this and say, all right. I'm going to tie this string, rope, cable, chain, whatever you want to call it, onto something. And I use that to put a force. Can, can I use the string to put a force on that? And we've been doing that, right? We would call this like, tension, right? We would say, look, you can, you can pull on it. That's called tension. Could I push with the string? I can't, can I? And so one thing that's nice about a flexible object, a string, a rope, a cable, a chain, is can you pull on it? Yeah, you can apply tension, and so this is called tension. Can you push with it? Which we call compression. No, you can't do that. Could, could you do compression with a rigid object? In other words, if this was bolted on here, could I pull this way? Could I apply a tension to it? Sure. But 
could I also push with it? Right, and so that's one thing we need to remember. And you're one thing that you'll appreciate as we do the problems. If you ever see a rope, a cable, a chain, a string, you know very simply that it's applying a tension, not a compression. You know which way the force is. It's in the direction of the string. Is that true for a rigid object? Do we know which way the force is? We don't. Could it be this way? Tension? Yeah. Could it be this way? Compression? Yeah. I'll even do one better. Does it even have to be in the direction of the rod itself? Could the rod be pushing this way, compression, and have a little twist to it? So even though the rod is pointing in this direction, the force is that direction? Is that possible? Yeah. And so this little sideways is called the shear. And so rigid objects can be compressed or they can shear. And I picked one that was flexible so you'd kind of see. But if it was turned this way, I could still probably get a force that is kind of in a direction this way, even though the object isn't that way. And so what I'm really trying to say here is if I have something right here and I have some kind of string or rope or chain or cable and I tell you that there is an angle of, say, 15 degrees, this is going to be nice, because do we know the direction of that force? Yes. The direction of the force is the direction of the rope, the string, the cable, the chain. It's flexible. It can't compress, and it can't twist, or can't have a shear to it. Okay? It can only have a tension. That's the easy case. But on the other hand, if we had an object here and we tied a rod to it and we said that the rod was coming off at some angle of 15 degrees, do we know the direction of the force on here? No. The direction of the force does not necessarily have to be in the direction of the cable. And so what we might have is we might have a force from this rod that is at some other angle, maybe 60 degrees. And so when the forces are transmitted by something that has a rigidness to it, we need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap thinking and looking at the physical picture and say, oh, the ride's at 15 degrees, hence the force is at 15 degrees. No, you don't know that. But you do know it for a cable or a rope. And that is an important step that your author goes through, really in part one, part two, part three, and then also in part four. But somehow, he doesn't explicitly say it, and I've seen that really trip students up on their homework or on a test where they get a picture with a rod and they just assume that the direction of the force is the same direction of the rod. And that's not the case. Like I said, it is for something flexible. It is not for something that is, is rigid. All right, well, as I promised, then I would take a few minutes. Oh, good. I stretched it out to 15 minutes. Now you're going to feel like you've got your money's worth and uh, you won't be asking for a refund. It's like, all right, I paid whatever tuition is for the class and got my money's worth today. I, teacher actually lectured 15 minutes. But the real key here is, let's do some practice here, okay? Let's see this in, in action. Let's see, see if I can e explain this. And I think what I call the bear trap, number 37, is probably the uh, simplest one here to do in terms of, well, I shouldn't say the simplest, but, but a one that kind of illustrates this really well and gets, gets us started. It is in equilibrium, and it does have a flexible object. There's a cable, and it also has a rigid object, which is this little uh, platform or beam that the bear is walking on. It says this in number 37. It says, mm -hmm. 
that a hungry bear weighing 700 newtons walks out on a beam in an attempt to retrieve a basket of food hanging from the end of the beam. The beam is uniform. It weighs 200 newtons. It is 6 meters long and the basket of food weighs 80 newtons. Then they show us a little picture. So the picture looks something like this. Here is the beam. As they said, 6 meters long. Okay. Now the beam is mounted to some vertical object over here. They don't really say what it is. And the beam then is put together in this little hinge or a pin, if you will. In other words, we just take a piece of metal and drill a hole in it and drive a cylinder-shaped object, a pin, in there. And so, see how the beam then can do something like this? Here's the pin and it can then rotate. Okay? And so it can freely rotate. Uh, like this, it would fall. So, they then take a cable and tie it and uh, they have it tied up to, and somehow this has some kind of overhang here, and so they tie it up to, to there. Uh, but they do say this cable then is 60 degrees here. Okay? The hungry bear is walking out on it. So, do I got to draw a bear? What does a bear look like? A uh, bear. Uh, bear. Uh, looks more like Snoopy. Uh, or Donald Duck or something. But anyways, there's my bear. <laughs> okay. And they say the bear has now gone a certain distance X out here. The basket itself is hanging over here somewhere. There's all these goodies inside here. It looks like a little Yogi Bear type of problem here, and so Yogi Bear is going to walk out and try to get the goodies. Now, I call it a bear trap because as I stop and I, and I do this first step that I've been trying to emphasize all semester, stop, get a good physical picture of what's going on. You will be surprised at how understanding the physical process will stop you from going down some really weird paths. You'll go, why'd you do that? <laughs> I don't know, I, I thought the beam was moving up. Really? <laughs> and so, when you realize what's happening, you won't do some, some, some weird things. And so, just getting that good physical picture eliminates a lot of problems. More than you probably have, have realized, because hopefully you've been seeing the picture in your head and not doing weird equations. It's like, well, no, that doesn't apply to this case. I didn't even think about doing that. Right. Okay? Because it's, that's not even close to what's happening here. Now, this one's going to take a little more physical intuition, I think, than maybe you've done, because you probably haven't built a, a bear trap like this. But the reason I call it a bear trap here is because look what happens as the bear walks out. I mean, I can call this T, tension in that cable. Does it change as the bear walks out? Why? Why would I need more force as the bear is walking out? Good. It's that static equilibrium. If you're thinking of this beam as pivoting, and then uh, forgetting the bear for just a second, the beam has a weight, the basket has a weight, these together make some kind of torque, and so we think about this, this is pulling the beam down, a clockwise direction. So it is this cable that is applying a force, and a force at a distance is the torque, it's applying the torque that's pulling it back up. And so without the bear on here, what we have is a constant force resulting in a constant torque counterclockwise balancing the two torques, the weight of the beam and the weight of the basket the other way. Then as we put the bear on here, there's going to need to be more torque this way, so more tension. And then as the bear moves out, and that's the key to the problem, as the bear moves out, the bear doesn't change its weight, but it is changing its torque, right? As it changes its position, it's applying more torque because torque had to do with not only the force, which in this case is the weight of the bear, but also the, the distance out. So with that in mind here, the torque is increasing as the bear walks out and hence the counter torque, if you will, the torque coming from the cable is going to increase. So we have to get more and more and more and more tension. And at some point, we would exceed the limit of the material itself. And so, sort of like this string here, if I pull harder, 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 
eventually I exceed the strength of the material and it breaks. Now again, for this class we're, we're not going to worry about the strength of the material and we're not going to ask, okay, how big should this cable be? How fat should it be? Should it be made out of steel or aluminum or should it be, you know, nylon rope versus a cotton rope? So we're not going to go down that road. That's like I said, that's next year, next fall when you take your engineering one. Uh, 15. In fact, I don't even think maybe you get quite even that far in 115. Maybe that's for later when you transfer to UCSB or whatever four-year institution you transfer to. So, yes, those are important questions. I'm just going to say this, that at some point it may break, right? And so if the bear comes out here five meters and it breaks, what's going to happen? It's going to swing down, bear's going to fall, there's the net, so we capture the bear. So, hence my idea of like, hey, this sounds like a good bear trap to me. Falls down in here and then we hook it back up and we hang the food out there and we wait for the next bear to come along. Of course, it's usually mother bear who sends out the cubs out there to get the food there so it doesn't break, you know, and so those of you who are backpackers probably understand that dilemma, right? I mean, what do you do when you're out in the woods with your food? Yeah, you're hanging on the tree for just this reason. No bear is foolish enough to go out on the end of a limb. It knows that limb can't hold it. So it's, it's a good safe place for your, for your food. It's also usually away from you. So you put your food over there and you, you camp over there. Another good reason there. <coughs> but those pesky little cubs, they can get your food. They're the ones who can get out to the end of that limb. So got to be careful with that. Anyways. So, this is <coughs> this idea. So, good. Step one, got the idea, good physical problem here. I mean, got a good physical understanding. Because the first question, and I'm glad the author asked it, but I kind of wish the author wouldn't ask it, because I'm hopefully you're in the habit already. This first one says, draw the free body diagram for the beam. Okay? So let's draw the free body diagram. But I'm hoping you're at the point that you would have drawn that anyways. And so I said it on the last test. I even noticed it that usually the students who get the problems right bothered to do the free body diagram. And there was a lot of people who didn't do the free body diagrams. And I'm just looking at it going, what does this mean? I mean, not only are, is it off, and I think it's off because they haven't done a free body diagram, it even makes it harder for me to give them partial credit because I don't have a free body diagram for them to, to look at. So, tell you, do the free body diagram. It's amazing how it will clarify your thoughts and keep you from going down the wrong road here. So, they ask it, I'm telling you, do the free body diagram. So, here's the beam. The idea of the free body diagram is just that. Draw just what you're interested. So, there's no bear, there's no cable, there's no food, there's just the beam. Alright, so what are the forces on the beam? Uh, what was that? Okay, one of them is the force of gravity. Where's the force of gravity on the beam? Okay, so they gave us a little clue here and they said it was a uniform beam. Why were they doing that? So we could know where the center of mass is. So we would know one of the forces acting on the beam is at its center. And they even go on to give us that number. Uh, I need to read it again here, but it says 200 newtons. So the beam itself is 200 newtons. Okay, good. What other forces are on this beam? Okay, the weight of the bear. The bear is over here somewhere, a distance x out here. And uh, they did say that the bear weighs 700 newtons. Okay, so um, and maybe I'll just put x here for the dimension out because they don't say what that is. And of course it can vary as the bear is walking out there. So 700. What other forces? Okay, I heard somebody say the weight of the food. Okay, good. And so they said the food is 80 newtons. Anything else? Yeah, the tension. Do we know the direction of the tension? You sure? Yes, right? We know that one, right? That's a cable. That's a flexible object. So the physical direction of the cable is 60 degrees, but also the force from the cable is at 60 degrees. So I'll put maybe a T here and put an angle of 60 degrees there. So yes, we do know the direction of that force. Okay, are we done? No, no we're not. Don't miss this one. Yeah, this pin. The pivot point, right? There is a piece of metal jammed in here to let this thing freely swing up and down. It makes it rotate. But can it put a force up? 
Couldn't it put a force horizontal? Yeah, so there is another force on this end of the beam. So I want to make sure you didn't miss it. What direction is it? Could it be up? Could it be out? Could it be at an angle? Yeah, it's a rigid object. The force from that wall on this beam is not in the direction of the beam. It's not perpendicular to the beam. We don't know what direction it is. It's not like the force from the cable. This is the force from the wall on the beam. So, how are we going to handle something like that? <laughs> yeah, obviously it has to be enough force to make this come into static equilibrium. That's the key to the problem. The tension in the cord and what we would call the reaction on the wall are adjusting themselves so that this will be in static equilibrium. So, here's probably the best approach when we're looking at a rigid object. Instead of me drawing it up at some unknown angle theta, why don't we do this? Why don't we say it would have an upward component and a horizontal component, right? And that's probably the best way then to look at it because even if we just drew it as a force with some unknown angle, that's what we would do to it. We would break it down into how much of the force is horizontal and how much is vertical anyways. So I'm going to draw it that way. I just want to make sure you realize I am not talking about two different forces here. There's only one force. It's the force from the wall on the beam and I just don't know its angle. So I like to call it um, Fy and Fx. And that's the last force. And again, I want to emphasize, it's just one force, but now I have the components of that. So if you do want to think of it as two, it's just as equivalent. So, so that's fine. But I think physically it helps me to think about everything touching it. All right, so the pen is touching it, the bear is touching it, the cable is touching it, the food cable is touching it. That's four. And then gravity, so five. Do I got five? One, two, three, four, five. Yep, there it is. So no other forces on this. So there's my free body diagram. Okay. So there was A. And as I said earlier, it's, I'm glad he asked it, but I'm hoping you would have done that anyways. Before you even ask it, just draw the free body diagram. Now the problem really begins. B. When the bear is one meter, so X equals one meter, find the tension in the wire and the components of the force exerted by the wall on the left end of the beam. Okay? And so that's what we were, we were talking about. Those three things. I'll close this so we don't have to listen to the whatever the maintenance crew is doing out there. Uh, and so again, what are we looking for then? Well, three unknowns. Tension, and the components, Fy and Fx. How many equations are we going to need for this? Three equations for three unknowns, right? But it's set up perfect because if this is going to be balanced, if this is going to be in equilibrium, then don't we know the sum of the forces in the X equal? Sum of the forces in the Y equal? Sum of the torques? Zero. There it is. Three equations. Three equations, three unknowns. So, let me write them out. So, sum of the forces in the x direction. That's got to be zero. Sum of the forces in the y direction. That has to be zero. Sum of the torques. And maybe I should put a little subscript z because forces in the xy plane give you a torque on that z axis. It would give you a, a rotation. And so, if the bear and all these other ones were too much, it would rotate around the z axis and it would go clockwise. If the tension was too much, it would pull the beam up and then that would make a, a rotation again around a z axis, but a, in a counterclockwise. So, there are our three equations. Now we go back to the stuff we've been doing way back since chapter five. Let's add up all these forces here. All right, so looking at the x direction, I guess I have fx here. 
Uh, no x, no x, no x. There's an x one. That would be minus t cosine 60 degrees. So there's my first equation, right? Add up all the forces in the x direction. There's only two of them. There is the x component of that tension, and then there is the x component from the, from the wall, the pin. If I did the y direction, well, let's see. The y direction would be an upward force of Fy here, okay. A downward force of 700 from the weight of the bear, okay. Another downward force of 200 from the weight of the beam. Another downward force of 80 from the weight of the food. And then an upward force of T sine 60 degrees. All right, so there would be my second equation. And then finally, the third equation would be to calculate the torque. Now, the forces we've been doing for a long time, so I think you're probably pretty good at that. Torques, not so much, but as I said, we were introduced in Chapter 10. We saw it again in Chapter 11. We do it a lot more here in Chapter 12. And so what I, I think I mentioned there when we were doing the lecture on torques was I think it's one of the harder things, but fortunately we see it after three chapters. You've got three weeks to sink in before the test comes. And, uh, well, we're almost there. We're five days away, but it's hopefully beginning to sink in here a little more. But hopefully you also saw this. One thing nice about torques is, does every force give you a torque? No. So a clever selecting of the axis of rotation may make the equation a lot easier. You don't really see it in this problem. In other words, if I were to ask you, where do you want to calculate the torques from? I bet you would pick where? That pin, right? And, and, and partly because that's physically what it actually rotates around, right? But as you'll see in some problems coming up here, if you don't want it to rotate around that pin, but we don't want it to rotate around any point. So couldn't we calculate the torques around any point? So it's not really needed for this problem, but please keep in mind that I could say this is point A, and what I really mean is the torques on the Z, around the z-axis around point A come out to be zero, but wouldn't the torques around the z-axis at point B also be zero, where maybe I'd pick the other end to be point B? Or what about the torques on the z-axis at some point C, where maybe point C is the center of the B? Does that make sense? You see, I started this problem saying, hey, we have three equations, three unknowns, perfect. But I'm trying to point out is we have a lot more than three equations. We've got two from the forces and we've got an infinite number from the torques. Because we can calculate the torques at any point. It could be A, it could be B, it could be C. And so some of those may be helpful. And I would say in this case we, we, we could, although I think it's probably best at this point just to do A by itself. That'll be enough information and we don't need to talk about B and C. But we, we could. Because why it becomes helpful is look at A for a moment. How much torque do you get from either Fx or Fy? Zero. Those are forces but no torques. So when I write out an equation, Fx and Fy won't be there. And if those are two of my unknowns, then those don't even show up in the equation. The only unknown that's going to show up here is T. Isn't that great? I mean, isn't it great to have one equation and one unknown? Isn't that a lot better than coupled equations? It is, isn't it? So looking for that can really help you with your math. You don't have to make the math quite so hard if you look forward to that. Okay? We could have done the same thing at B. Look at B. What advantage would that give us? How much torque do you get from the tension? Zero. And I would even say this force, although it's acting way over here, Fx, but because it goes straight through, how much torque do you get from Fx? Zero. And so if we were to write out the torque around the point B, the only thing that would show up in the equation is Fy. And we could just solve that equation. One equation, one unknown. Love it. The way I have it now is I've got the three unknowns in the two equations, and if those show up here, I would have 
coupled equations, a system of equations, which is a little harder to solve. Not unreasonable, I know you can, so I don't, I don't think that's a difficulty. But like I said, a clever choice of your torques can actually be to your advantage. Okay, so maybe we'll emphasize that more in later problems, but uh, I'll see it here in A where I go to calculate the torque. Because as I go to calculate the torque, as I said, your Fx and Fy don't even show up. Are there forces? Yes. Are there torques? No. So now let's go to the bear. The bear has a torque. What would its value be? Yeah, good. And so maybe I should put the equation for torque over here. We could think of it as this equation, or we could think of it as this equation. Uh, we had four of them. These are the two that I'm kind of thinking in my mind. This one is kind of nice here because we know the perpendicular distance, or we could say the sine is 90 degrees, but the distance is one meter, and the magnitude is 700 newtons, and so, of course, that's 700 newton meters. And we probably should ask, is, is this a positive torque or a negative torque? Yeah, the traditional, it's negative. It's going to make it rotate in a clockwise direction. Hopefully you can get that either from the physical picture by saying, look, when the bear pushes this way, that makes the rod go clockwise. Okay, and so if I take my fingers and turn them clockwise, I get into the board. This is a negative torque. Or if you just want to do that right-hand rule we talked about, there is R, there is F. So if you put your finger out towards F and your index finger towards the force, right, or R cross F, and you close in, my thumb is into the board. So I'm going to put a little negative sign in there because this is a torque, yes, but its direction is negative. It is a rotation on the z-axis in a clockwise direction. Likewise for the weight of the beam. What's the torque from the weight of the beam then? Okay, so the distance is 3 meters, the magnitude of the force is 200, the direction is also negative, right? This is rotating it in a clockwise direction. We also get a torque from this basket. What's the torque from the basket? Well, it too is going to be negative. It's 6 meters out. It's only 80 newtons of force but that would be the torque. So those three all are rotating in a clockwise direction. There are different distances, six, three, and one, so I've got to separate them out, but that is the torques making them all go in the negative direction. What about that cable or rope? Yeah, that's pointed in a positive direction. And again, maybe you can see it from the mental picture that if I kind of held it here with my finger and I pulled it this way, that's going to make the beam rotate in a counterclockwise direction, which we call that a positive rotation. We put our fingers, we curled it in the direction of rotation, and we get our thumb pointing out. Or if you want to do an R cross F, I would take my right hand, put my fingers in R, close them towards the force, and then my thumb is out of the board. So. Negative, 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 yes, positive. And then how would we calculate that torque? And it's probably best to use this equation, right? The distance out is six meters. The amount of force is the unknown T. Good, that's what shows up. That's a one unknown variable in there. And sine of 60 degrees or 120, if you want to do the 120, I guess it's technically 120, but anyway, between them. So there is the angle between them. So now I can solve this problem, and that's why, personally, even though torques are newer to you, maybe they're a little harder to understand, they often can be easier to calculate in terms of the math because we can eliminate a lot of the other forces in them and we can only end up with one unknown. One equation, one unknown. So obviously this is 700 here, this is 600 here, this is 480 there, and so maybe I should put all those uh, together. Uh, 700, a 600, a 480. So all those together is 1,780. 
um, negative. So when I move it to the other side, it becomes positive. So when I divide it by six meters and divide that by the sine of 60 degrees, I should get, oh, and I should check what mode my calculator is in here. Um, but assuming it's in degrees, I got 342 newtons. Um, degrees, yeah, okay. Seemed right. And so that must be the tension in that cable. So assuming that that cable or that rope doesn't break at 342 newtons, everything's good. The bear is a, a meter out. Nothing is broken yet anyways. Maybe the bear is going to move a little bit further. Now, once we've done that, which I think is the hardest part of the problem, we can finish it with, with this statement here. We can come back up here and say, well, Fx is this T cosine of 60 degrees. And so if I do that, I get my 342 times the cosine of 60 degrees, and that's about 171 newtons. So 171 newtons for Fx. And likewise here, this one is saying Fy is, and I guess I'll put all these together, that's 980. So 980, um, move it to that side and it's positive, and subtract T sine of 60. Hopefully that makes sense because it's these two lifting up have to balance those three pushing down. So 980 minus uh, 342 times the sine of 60 comes out to be 683 newtons. And so I've answered the question, what is the tension in the cable? What are the components? I'll go one step further because I'm kind of curious then, what is then the total force on that beam and at what angle? And so didn't ask it, but this horizontal force, Fx, is 171 newtons, and then the upward force, Fy, is 683. So the total magnitude of the force is, of course, the 171 squared plus this 683 squared, taking the square root. And so there's the total force on the beam, 171 squared plus 683 squared equals square root of all of that is about 704 newtons. And so that's what the force is. What angle is it? Well. The angle would, I guess, be the arc or inverse tangent of 683 over 171. So inverse of 683 over 171 coming in to about 76 degrees. So if that had been more of the question, which they didn't ask, but I wanted you to see it, is that it's like, okay, that would be the, the angle here. And so there's the, the beam up at, a, at an angle, okay? Well, the other part of this problem then goes on to C, what if? What if this wire can withstand a maximum tension of 900? All right, so, we just calculated 342. So it's, this cable is in no danger of breaking yet. But it says here, if this cable can handle a tension up to 900, um, what is the maximum distance that the bear can walk out before it breaks? So where is it going to break here? I mean, how far can that bear get before it, it breaks? All right, well, hopefully you kind of see the setup that it really comes back to just this equation. I don't think we need to come back up to here, but if I use this as a, as a variable and say, okay, what is X? When the tension is 900, and then I can solve for, for X. So let's give that a try. So the sum of the torques all around the Z axis around point A is zero. And so now the bear is a negative x times 700. So there's the torque from the bear. 
whatever the bear's distance, x, and then the 700 with the negative. Uh, minus the 600 newton meters, and I'll just put it together like we did uh, here, 600. This is the, you know, the distance of the 3 meters and the weight of the beam. Uh, the basket of food is the other negative, 480 newton meters. In fact, maybe I'll just put that together because a 6 and a 4 make 10. So there is 1080 newton meters of how, how much torque we get from the weight of the beam and the, the weight of the uh, food basket here. And all of that then would have to be connected to this 6 meters, uh, was it 900 I said? And then sine of 60 degrees. So solve for x. What is the position here of that uh, a bear? So yes, there's a few steps of algebra there, but I, I think you're getting good with the, with the algebra here. Let me, let me do this one first. This is 6 times 900 times sine of 60 degrees which is 4,676. Let me subtract off this 1080 here. And so that's the total there. If I bring this to the other side, it's positive. Now, if I divide that by the 700, we're looking at just a hair over 5 meters. So 5.14 meters is what I calculate then. So as this bear gets out, not quite to the end, that's why I said I think of this as a bear trap. Poor bear's not going to get the food. It's going to snap down and capture the bear and we're going to reset it and wait for another bear, I guess, here. So that's when the cable breaks. And uh, we're all set up. Make sense? And like I said, if that makes sense, then, the, 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 then this whole section, this whole chapter is hopefully going to be just the same thing again and again and again. And, and really... I hate to say it this way, but you kind of know you're ready for the test when you're like, yeah, isn't that the same problem? Isn't he just doing the same thing again and again? Isn't physics just about a few fundamental ideas <laughs> that explain a universal phenomenon, right? It's just, it's just a few ideas. Just, you're just doing the same thing over and over. And not that I want you ever to be bored, but it's probably a good sign when you are bored because it's like, it's the same problem. It's the same problem. It's the same problem. Yeah. And so it's just the same steps again and again and again. Pl apply to a different situation. Here's a good one. Here's number 41. I think this is the crane problem. So here we got a construction crew and they're making a crane. Now we don't see this much where we live. We don't have the big skyscrapers where they mount the cranes on the side of the building and they make the floors go higher and higher and higher. Um, if you lived in New York, there'd be a different story. You'd probably every block have some kind of crane or, you know, some kind of construction or remodeling going on. But they got to get materials up there. And so this is what this is. It says in 41, a crane of mass 3,000 kilogram supports a load of 10,000 kilograms as shown in the figure. The crane can pivot around a frictionless pin A and it rests against a smooth support at B. Find the reactionary forces at points A and B. Well, the picture it would be very helpful here. Here is the side of the building. And on the side of the building, we mount a pivot, if you will, a little pin. Uh, we put kind of a second flat one down here. And the idea then is we build what they kind of show uh, a crane, a superstructure, kind of looks something like this. It's probably just made out of a bunch of I-beams welded together here. And so maybe we get something that looks like this. We put a little pulley at the end with a motor on it and a cable that can go down with the idea that the trucks can deliver across the street and then the crane goes down and grabs it off the, off the truck and it brings it on up. 
uh, added to this is the crane can probably pivot over and bring the materials. So we're going to bring the materials up to the, you know, whatever. The, this could be pretty high, 10th floor, and you, you really don't want to be carrying these up by hand here up to the, to the 10th floor here. So the crane goes on. There. Now, these things can get pretty heavy. What are you lifting? Well, what it says here is we're going to lift something that is 10,000 kilograms. So 22,000 pounds here. So we, we got quite a bit of material we're, we're bringing up to the construction site. The crane itself, they said, is 3,000 kilograms. But they don't really say it in the words I read. In the picture, and it's maybe not shown as well in my picture, but the, the base of the crane here is wider and it narrows in. So the center of mass is not going to be at the center of the object. Okay? It's going to be closer towards the building there. And they label it in the diagram here. They say that that center of mass is the equivalent of two meters out, even though the end of the crane extends out six meters. So that's the, the bottom part of the uh, figure. They also say that these two pivot points, or I guess the pivot A and this contact point B, are one meter apart. Okay. And so there's our picture of our crane. And I'll read it again. A crane of mass 3,000 kilograms supports a load of 10,000 kilograms as shown in the figure. The crane can pivot around a frictionless uh, point uh, pin at A and it can rest against a smooth support B. Find the forces at points A and B. In other words, what is the building putting on here? Because obviously as we go to mount this, we want to know what those forces are. How big are they? Because if we don't know how big they are, we don't know how strong to mount this to the building. And if we don't do it right, the crane's going to fall down when it tries to lift up the, the load. And obviously, we don't want that to happen. So we've got to be careful about the limits of our forces here. And this is a good example of that. We need to know what they're going to come out to be. And hence, then we need to know how much material or how thick the uh, pin and the uh, support bolts need to be into this building to, to lift that load. And again, our areas, we don't think much about this, but uh, I was with a friend in New York City and I was surprised at how many cranes there were. And I was surprised to learn there's a, there's a whole department of crane operations for the city of New York. I mean, they got to go and inspect all these cranes and make sure they're mounted and things are calculated right. And it's like, well, that's a different world. But nonetheless, that's what this, this, this is here. All right. So how do you do this? Well, again, we don't want it to fall. So what do we know about the sum of all the forces? Good question. Um, I don't know if it really matters, but are those two rods connected to the point where they both parallel? Or do they kind of... Uh, which two rods? Like point Here? Point A, point B, and point B, the whole crane system? Uh, are they parallel or does it matter? Because I wonder if the angle change between... Not 100% sure what, if I understand what you're asking, but I, I know it won't matter. Oh, these? No. No, this is more of a triangular shape. And they don't really give that shape. And fortunately, as we begin to analyze it, it won't matter. Okay? So, this is the key here. What do we know about the sum of all the forces in the X direction? <laughs> They got to be zero. That's the whole point of this, this, this chapter. Uh, please don't think they always come out to be zero, but they always will in this chapter, okay? And like I said, when you take your statics class in a year, it'll always be that way in the statics class too, but, but that's not always the case. Things can move. But in this case, we don't want the crane to move. So we've got to have the sum of all the, the forces. In fact, maybe I, I should... Uh, be more explicit here and do what I said earlier, we should draw the free body diagram. We should draw just the crane by itself. 
So with the crane by itself, what forces are acting on the crane? Okay, well, I heard somebody say gravity. Sure enough, there is 3,000 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. That's the rate of the, the weight of the crane. Sure. Any other forces on the crane? Okay, I, I, I heard all of them. That's good. Uh, one I heard is, well, what about this weight that it's lifting up? Oh, excellent. Yeah. Do we know the direction of the force? You sure? We do, don't we? It's connected by a cable, right? And so the cable is pointing straight down, so this would be 10,000 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. So, yes, that's a flexible object. We know the direction on a, a cable like, like that. All right? Um, anything else? I guess I heard you guys say it already. Isn't the crane then touching the building at two points, A and B? So, let's look at point A. How would I label the forces at A? Yeah, do we know the direction of that force? No, we don't. And so that goes back to kind of why I did this bear problem first is this is a contact on a rigid object. We don't know if this force is just up or just horizontal, probably something in between. And so it might be something off like this. So the best way to handle that is to say it would have components. It would have so much up and so much horizontal. Now if you really think of a, a head on this one, you might even want to label FX the other direction. But for the sake of just kind of working out the problems, and when I solve this, I bet the force FX is really this way. Why would I say that? Yeah, think of it this way. I mean, if this were to come loose, but not this one, which actually this isn't really a hinge, but if it was a hinge, a pin here, and that one were to break with all this pulling, what would happen to this? Wouldn't it rotate around this point? So to keep it from rotating around this point, what is this one doing? It's actually pulling this way. So not a surprise that when I solve this, I bet this will come out to be a negative number indicating that the force in the x direction isn't really in the negative direction. It's not in the positive direction. And if I saw that ahead of time, maybe I would draw it. But I'm not, I'm not that smart, so I don't see it. I'm just going to put fx and say, look, that, that's the force. And I'll go through the math and it comes out to be a negative number. Okay. So it's, that's, that, that's fine. But that's kind of what I, again, want you to kind of analyze as you do the problem. Look at that, that, that physical picture. Let's go down to point B down here. Do we know the directions of that one? And surprising we do know this one. I know it's a rigid object. And so I'm sure your first reaction is no, no we don't. But, but, but they did something a little different in, in, in B. Let's, let's go back to the words here. Let's, let's see how they de described it here. Uh, what was this, 41? They said this. The crane can pivot with a frictionless pin at A, but rests against the smooth support B. So do we have a, a pin, a hinge? No, it's, it's, just, it's just pushing against the wall like this. And it's smooth. So what are they trying to say by it's smooth? No friction? So if you were to put your hand on something smooth like this whiteboard, this whiteboard can only do what? A normal force, right? Push back. It doesn't push sideways. It doesn't push in the plane. There's no friction. I'd need friction for that. And it's certainly not saying there's a hinge in here, which I can then use the molecules to push up and down. It's not that. It's just resting smoothly. And so we do know that one. And so I will call it force at B. And it's just straight out. Has no vertical components to it. Which is actually kind of nice here because I might say, how many unknowns do I have? 
We got three equations, right? Three unknowns. Perfect. Forces in the x's, forces in the y, torques. Although, I don't want to forget, I have torques, 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 torques. I've got an infinite number of torques. I can do it around any number of points I need in order to solve for those many unknowns. And so that's what you would have to do if you wanted to find the forces between this beam and that 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 beam. And that's what we said. If you guys saw the students working in our lab Monday, they were that's what they were doing. They were trying to build a bridge and they were calculating all the forces on all those little components of the bridge to see what the what the forces were coming out to be. All right, so now back to this and I, I like I said I should have done that free body diagram before I started this but good physical picture of what's going on right free body diagram or step two step three write out the equation step four solve the equation so I've got the sum of the forces equal to zero I've got the sum of the forces in the y directions equal to zero and the sum of the torques in the z-axis equals zero and then I should probably ask, well, what axis do you want to calculate it around? And I want to emphasize, it's got to be zero around every axis, right? It's not just one axis. We don't want it to rotate around any axis. Although, I must admit, probably the best one to calculate would be, I think, A. Why? Well, one is the physical picture. Isn't that where the pin is? Isn't that where it does have the ability to rotate? Assuming the crane doesn't break. Okay, fair enough. <coughs> but also, don't I have two, two of my variables there? So how much torque am I going to get from those two? Zero. They're going to go away. They're not going to be part of the equation. And then all I'm going to get is that one. And so then I will just have that one equation with that one unknown. But let's say I didn't look that far ahead let's just write it out here forces forces and forces okay so looking at the forces in the X direction here it looks like I've got an FX plus an FB that has to come out to be zero well that equation alone tells me one of those two has to be positive and one has to be negative right the only way it's going to come out to be zero so that's another indication to me right away that fx is really that way so fx is a negative number fb is a positive number those two forces are equal in magnitude opposite in direction that's how we're going to get this thing to to balance uh, fy fy would be these forces in the vertical direction so i have the vertical component here fy and that one's going up and then I got the downward ones which is 3,000 times 9.8 and I got another downward one of 10,000 times 9.8 and oh that's it oh that one's kind of nice that only has one unknown in it right I won't solve it yet but that's nice to see here I can just one equation and one unknown and so my third equation is the torques and again, need to pick an axis. I'm going to pick the point A because that point A means that I get no torque from these guys and now I can get the torque from these other ones. Why don't I do the torque from the weight of the crane? How far out then? Perpendicular distance. And so remember, torque can be calculated in a number of different ways. This is one of them probably not as useful as this one what's the perpendicular distance because that's what they labeled the perpendicular distance so how far is it from here to there would be this R I don't know the angle I don't know but the two together is the perpendicular distance and I do know that one so that's the best approach on this one that I would go a distance of two so the distance is two the force is the 3,000 times the 9.8. And now direction? Yeah, that's negative like that bear trap there. That's pulling it to make it rotate in a clockwise direction. And again, hopefully you'll see that from either of the reasons we have. Pull on it, see that this would pull the crane in a clockwise direction. That's a negative rotation. Or cross product draw an R and an F use your right hand 
Fingers towards R, close towards F, thumb is into the board, R cross F then is a negative torque. So this is its magnitude, this is its direction. And this heavy load is doing the same thing while you're lifting it up. Now it's a little further out, so it's six meters. It also has a lot more weight on it, uh, but it is in the negative direction for the same reason. It, I'm going to make it rotate in a clockwise direction. So those two are making it rotate in a clockwise direction. What's this one doing? This is the one that would do what? Yeah, you push on here, it should make it rotate in a counterclockwise direction. So this is our positive torque. So we have two rotating clockwise, another one going counterclockwise. And again, if you want to use your cross product, R would be straight down. So we're doing it from point A, so I'd put my fingers down, R close towards B, R cross B gives me my thumb out. So it is a positive torque. Now as far as calculating the magnitude, I guess I'm a distance of one meter away, a perpendicular distance, and then I would have the force of, of B. And so there is our three equations. And by the time you get to here, the hard stuff is done. The physics is done. Yes, we still have some math to do. Fortunately, only one unknown here, one unknown here, and then this will be pretty easy to solve once we get, get that one. So getting my calculator out here, this is a 2 times a 3,000 times a 9.8. The other one here is a 6 times a 10, 1, 2, 3, thousand, times 9.8. And the two together is 646,800 newton meters, negative. I'll move it to this side to make it positive, divide by 1. And so that becomes FB. So the force at B, and hopefully not surprisingly, is going to be a very large number. And so the edge of this crane is pushing against that really hard. And hopefully you'll see why. I mean, it would essentially, forgetting the weight of the crane even, you've got 10,000 kilograms pulling down here six meters away. To balance that with only one meter means you've got to push six times more because you've got six times less distance. So you've got to have six times more force to balance that one. Now this one's only two meters, so you've got to have two times that one. But, the, but this guy's got to balance each of these, and it comes out to be a huge number. So 646,800 newtons it means that is how much construction we've got to put on this crane here to, to keep it from, from pushing here. Uh, Fy, of course, works out in this equation. And so Fy looks like uh, the we can just put the 10,000 and the 13, uh, 3,000 together to make 13. 13 times 9.8 is 127. 127, 400 newtons is the vertical component. Um, and then using that up here to solve for Fx, Fx being the negative of Fb means that the sideways force again, or horizontal force, I guess I should say here, is, is huge. So, not at all a fair representation in this, this picture. If the vertical force here is about 100,000, then this horizontal force is, you know, six times bigger in the negative direction. So, it's a huge force then, off in that, in that direction. All right, well, how about we try yet another one similar to this, uh, maybe even a little bit easier, it's 43. And as I said, I think you're getting the idea of calculating the torques as well as the forces, although the forces we've been doing for enough weeks that I, I think you're probably pretty good with, with that one. All right, so number 43 here is again kind of like this crane we're going to carry a, a heavy load here this says a 10 
thousand newton, not kilograms this time, so this is ten times smaller than that, but a ten thousand newton shark is supported by a cable attached to a four meter rod that can pivot at its base. Calculate the tension in the tie rope between the rod and the, the wall. Assuming that the tie rope is holds the system in position as shown at a 60 degree angle. Also find the horizontal and vertical forces extended on the base of the rod and go ahead and ignore the weight of the rod. And so the picture they have, I don't know if you've ever seen these off fishing piers, I, our pier is not really a, a fishing pier here, but go down to Gaviota here. And they've got this little configuration here. Uh, here's the, the side of the building, if you will. Uh, but your heavy catches need to be hung up here, and so they've got this rod here. And so in this case, they've caught a shark, whatever a shark looks like. How about that? Nah. Nah, I should try better than that. A uh, shark. Uh, uh, shark's got a fin. And another fin. Pectal fins. Alright, well that's the best I can do. But better than the alpha symbol anyways there. Okay, so there's my, there's my shark here hanging here. And they say that this shark is 10,000 newtons. That's about a thousand kilograms. That's uh, a ton. So good size shark. And so we're going to hang it here. Um, let me give a little more height to my building. Because then they say that you tie a rope on here to keep it from coming off. And it's hanging over at 20 degrees as they they shown in the in the picture here. Okay. You've set it up so that this is a 60 degree angle here. So it, you kind of swing it out. Uh, I guess you would swing it out then 30 degrees. So you have 60 degrees from the horizontal. Okay. And so there's our our shark. Okay. So 10,000 newton shark supported by a cable attached to a four meter rod. So we should probably put the four meters in here. So four meter rod is in here. So that's how long the rod is. Okay. So it can pivot at its base. Calculate the tension in the rope between the rod and the wall. Assume that the tie rope is holding the system in the position as shown at 60 degrees. Also find the horizontal and vertical forces extended on the base of the rod. Go ahead and ignore the weight of the rod. So not worrying about the weight of the rod. It's probably small compared to the weight of the shark and the other forces involved here. And so what is that tension T? Well, I'll pause there, right? Got a good physical picture of what's going on here. How the cable is connected over up at an angle of 20 degrees, how the rod extends out at an angle of 60 degrees, how we've got a heavy object hanging here. Because the second thing is that free body diagram. So let me do the four meter rod here. Here's my rod. It's four meters long. Let me ask you, what forces are on this rod? Okay, yeah, good. I heard the weight of the shark. Sure. So there's 10,000 newtons. Anything else? Sure. I heard another one that says, what about the tension in that uh, cable that's off at 20 degrees uh, from the horizontal? Yes, definitely. I mean, that is what we're asked to look for. Anything else? Uh, don't need to worry about the weight of the rods. They said don't worry about the weight of the rod. Anything else? Yeah, the fact that it is pivoting down here, there's some kind of pivot point, some kind of pivot, some kind of axis of rotation here. Um, and so there would be some forces. Do we know the direction of that one? In fact, maybe I should have asked it back here. Do we know the direction of the force from this tie rod? I mean, a tie rope. Yeah, we do, right? We know that it's the same direction as the cable. So that's the easy case. But this one, do we know that one? We don't know what direction that one is. So why don't I just label it as so much in the upward direction and so much in the horizontal direction. Okay? Because does it have to be in the same direction as the rod? No. Now I must admit it might be nice if it was because if you push on a rod in the same direction, there's less of a tendency for it to break than if I push 
some other direction, not the direction of the rod. See how it kind of flexes there from the what we'll call the shear of it. So probably best if it was that way, but there's no reason me, for me to think that it is that way because it's a rigid rod and that's obviously what I did about an hour ago when I tried to, tried to explain that. All right, but other than that, I hope you see it's the same thing as the crane and the same one as the bear trap we did before here is let's add these up here. So let me go ahead and add them up here. Uh, first thing I would say is what is the sum of the forces in the x direction? Well, if we're going to make this thing balance, it's got to come out to be zero. What is the sum of the forces in the y direction? Again, if we want this to balance, we want this at static equilibrium, it's got to come out to be zero. What are the sum of the torques around the z-axis? Again, if we don't want it to rotate, it's got to come out to be zero. Now we could ask ourselves what point, but it's allowed any point, so if we call the physical point that it can actually rotate A, instead of calculating it at some other point, but again, other problems, it may be nice to calculate other points. And we haven't done any of that yet, Hopefully before the day's over, what are we, 10, 15, so within the next 45 minutes, we'll, we'll have one like that. It's, it's kind of nice to do it around a, a different point. It might make the math a little bit easier. It may, may make looking at the picture different, but it may make the, the math easier. All right, well, let me add it up here. So here I would get some of the forces in the x direction here. Uh, no x, no x. Does this have an x? Sure. So it would be negative t cosine of 20 degrees. So there would be one of my three equations that I have here. And I need three equations, right? Because I've got a t and then an fx and then an fy. Uh, how about the y direction? Well, I've got fy pushing up. I've got the shark at 10,000 pushing down. But I also have another part pushing up there, right? Yeah, don't I have T sine of 20 degrees? And unfortunately, neither one of these can be solved by themselves. They are coupled together. And then between the two of them, there are three unknowns. So I can't solve anything quite yet. But this is, again, a lot of times the key to making problems easier is pick a good axis. My definition of a good axis is one that if you've got three unknowns may eliminate two and you'll have one equation with one unknown. And that would work here because our two unknowns are here. You calculate the torque around this point. How much torque do you get from those two again? Zero. And so we only have to worry about the torque from these two. So let me go ahead and calculate the torque. Why don't I start with the shark? Of course, this kind of begs the question, how do you want to calculate the torque? Is it RF sine of the angle between them or R perpendicular F? Maybe I should ask you this time, which way you want to do it? This one? <laughs> All right. It's about, uh, good. I, I see you're saying it's kind of the same. Why don't we do that one? Uh, we'll do that one for both of them. We'll do it for the shark and we'll do it for the uh, Thai one. In fact, I think this makes the most sense for the Thai one. This, this one might be a little hard for the, uh, the Thai one, but uh, this one would be real easy for the shark also. But I'll do this one for the shark because the force from the shark is four meters away, so I would put four meters. The amount of force from the shark is 10,000. The angle between the R and F is... Thirty degrees. Isn't this R coming out here? So isn't that the thirty degrees there? Okay. And so I thought maybe I better do that to make sure you see, you know, what what angle. There's a lot of angles up here. And the thirty degrees not even label in the problem. <laughs> the sixty is. <laughs> But that's not the one we want. We want the angle between the R and the F. So it's sine of 30. Or 150 really would be formally correct, but which is the same as the, the sine of, of 30. All right, so there it is. Now is it plus or minus? Yeah, isn't that a negative torque? Like we saw with the other ones. Isn't this shark then pulling this whole rod system to rotate in a clockwise direction? 
So there's the magnitude and then the direction of the torque. And of course, the other one, this tie rope, positive or negative? Okay, that's positive. That's how this is going to come out to be zero. Since one's got to be positive, one's got to be negative. But going through the same thing, I would have to say, well, what's the distance? Well, it's four meters also. How much force do you get? T, okay, that's the unknown. What's the angle? Uh, good, I heard the right answer. It is 80 degrees. And again, it's not even shown up there. Well, 80 came from where? Well, the fact that this is 60 from the fact that these two are parallel, right? And so that angle is the total angle between the R and the F, which in this case is that tie rod there. So it's not a 30, it's not a 20, it's not a 60. <laughs> Okay, those are listed up there, but that's not what you want. It's uh, 60 and 20, which is sine 80. Okay. And so there is my, my torques. Well, of course, now this one can be solved here real quick. Um, in fact, they each have a 4 on them, so that's kind of nice. They kind of factor off. Sine of 30 is nice. That just makes that a 5,000. And so... And see what the number comes out to be here. So I got 5,000 for that first term, move it over and it's positive. Then all I got to do is divide it by the sine of 80 and coming up to be 5,077. So T is 5,077 newtons for the amount of tension in that tie rod. Okay. And of course, then once I know that, I can solve this for Fx because that is T times the cosine of 20, which comes out to be 4,770 newtons. And then this one, Fy, I guess comes out to be... 10,000 minus 5,077 times the sine of 20 degrees. And so we're looking at 8,263 newtons. So we've answered the three questions that they've asked. What is the tension in the tie rope? And what are the forces on the bottom of that rod? What is the X component? What is the Y component? Of course, we could put them together and find its total magnitude, but in the interest of time, let me, let me not do that, but just kind of set that one up there. Now, let me point out something that I've seen students make many, many, many times, and maybe some of you are still looking at that. Remember when we did this angle over here? Remember, the, the angle was 30 here, and it was 80. See, because when we're doing torque, we are interested in the angle what? Yeah, the angle between the R and the F. So the angle is in relationship to the R and the F. It's not in relationship to the grid, the X and Y coordinate system. That's what we needed up here for the forces. So getting the angles for the forces was in relationship to the grid that we laid out. That's why we had numbers like cosine of 20 and sine of 20. Because that angle was listed according to the grid. But when we went over to torques, we didn't have the 20s or the 60s. It was about the angle between the R and the F. And that could be different than the grid. And so keep that in mind as you, as you do the problem. It's easy to kind of mix those two. All right, well, let's try here 45. I think this is a little more complex than any of the, the other ones we've done so far. But hopefully by now, you're going to see that it's really the same problem. And you just, you know, add up the forces, set them equal to zero. Add up the torques, set them equal to 
to zero here. We want this thing to be balanced. Well, number 45 says this. It says, a force is exerted on a uniform rectangular cabinet that weighs 800 newtons as shown in the figure. All right, so maybe I'll put this on the uh, board here. But number 45 has this cabinet And they give the dimensions of the cabinet. They say its height, or what they label as L, probably for the length here, is 100 centimeters. So it's a meter high. And its width is 60 centimeters. Okay? And it says a force is exerted on it. And so at some height up, which they call H, there is a force pulling on it at an angle of 37 degrees with a force of what they call capital F. So it's a cabinet a meter high. This, this table here is probably a good example. This table's a meter high. Um, pretty close anyways. Well, a little less than a meter. Okay. So here's my table or here's my cabinet. Now they only have it about 60 centimeters wide, so it's probably about that wide. But if I were to reach down and grab it and pull it, right, that's kind of what they're saying here. So here's a cabinet. Somebody reaches down, so they grab the cabinet. Maybe there's a handle here, and they pull it with some force F, 37 degrees. So there's the force being ap applied to our cabinet. So I'll start again. A force is exerted on a uniform. Uniform, what does that tell me? Yeah, they tell me where the center of mass is, right? It's right in the center of this thing. Okay, so a uniform cabinet weighing 400 newtons. So somewhere right smack in the center is the equivalent of all of its weight, the force of gravity pulling down, 400 newtons. It's shown in the figure A. The cabinet slides with a constant speed when F equals 200 newtons and the height is 0.4 meters. Find the coefficient of kinetic friction and the position of the resulting normal force. B. Taking F to be 300 newtons, find the value of H for which the cabinet begins to tip over. Okay, so there's the pivot, tip over, there's the, the torque. But let's go back to A. A is a little different than anything we've done, because this one's actually moving. I don't think I would call this a static equilibrium problem, because is it static? No, you're going to pull it across the floor. Here's what they're saying. You reach down, you grab the cabinet, and you're pulling it. So you're sliding it across the floor. Now, one thing they were nice about me in this, they said, they said it, it slides across the floor at a constant speed. So what does that tell me? Some of the forces is zero and which gives me acceleration of zero, but some of the torques is also zero. So it's just going to slide across the floor. So we often refer to this, we didn't use the word, as a dynamic equilibrium instead of a static equilibrium, but it's still an equilibrium. It's still that all the forces come out to be zero. Now they weren't at first. At first I do have to have an acceleration. There's got to be some amount of force that gives it an acceleration. So forgetting that part, once I get it going, now I'm just applying enough force so that it balances with the friction and the gravity and the normal force so that the forces all add up to be zero. In fact, that's where I want to start. Like all these problems, is after I got a good physical picture of what's going on, and so maybe I should pause there. So you got that physical picture then? We're going to take this cabinet. These are its dimensions. This is where we're holding it. We're going to slide it across the floor. The next step is that free body diagram. And so I will make the cabinet just by itself, which is essentially what I have there. And then I will draw all the forces on the cabinet. Maybe I'll do that in blue so they stand out. What are the forces on the cabinet? I guess I kind of already started to do that. One of them is right here. This is the 400 newtons. That's the weight of the cabinet. It's right in the center. It's a uniform cabinet. Okay. Any other forces on this cabinet? <laughs> 
Yeah, obviously there is this one that is at some angle of 37 degrees. And they even said this one in A. Um, a is uh, the cabinet slides with a constant speed when a force of 200 newtons. So there's a second force. Any others? Yeah, there's friction. And so that would be across the bottom here. And wouldn't it be a kinetic friction? Sliding going on, right? It's not a static friction? Okay. So I've got some kinetic friction across the bottom. All done? All right, normal. And I think now we're all done, right? Everything that's touching it, which basically is just the ground in my hand, and then force of gravity. So normal. Where's the normal force? Well, it's going to be up, but is it up at this point in the center? Over here? It doesn't matter? And this is really the first time? Yes, it does matter, right? We've always done just forces up, down. Big deal. But now where the force acts would, can, would apply a torque, right? So I'm not even sure where it is. But maybe I can say, why don't I do this? Why don't I say the force is the normal force? And why don't I just say it's some distance x from this corner? And so we can talk more about its position in, in just a moment. I don't think we need to know the position of the normal force yet. That is really the question in B. A is a little simpler than that. A is find the coefficient of kinetic friction. Oh, there it is. And the position of the resulting normal force. So that is part A. Part B then is about the tipping. Okay. So really they're asking what X is, right? What's the position of this normal force? And what's the, the coefficient? So, there is step two, free body diagram. And so let's write out our equations here. So the first one would be, let's look at the sum of the forces in the x direction. Once we're moving, we don't want any more acceleration. So like I said, I'd call this more of a dynamic equilibrium than a static equilibrium. Uh, I grabbed it because I, I, I think you can elevate to this problem. It's not quite though the title of the chapter static equilibrium uh, but nonetheless the forces still come out to be zero so as I look at the horizontal direction it looks like I've got a frictional force and the force from my hand now the force from my hand would be 200 newtons and then it would be cosine of 37 degrees so there's my horizontal and then minus the force of friction and the force of friction is the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And the problem is, you know, find the coefficient of friction. Which means, of course, I need to also find the normal force. And the other part of this is find the position of that normal force. So, I'll go on and do the y direction. In the y direction, I guess I've got a normal force pushing up. I also have a component from my hand that is pushing up. That's the 200 and then the sine of the 37 degrees. Those are each up. And the thing that is down is, of course, the weight of it. And again, that has to be zero. It's not accelerating upward. It's not even moving upward. So it's a, it's a static equilibrium in a vertical direction. It's a dynamic equilibrium in a, in a horizontal direction. But that right there lets me find n. So I'll get my calculator out and get n, because once I get n, I can get the coefficient of friction. And I can answer the first half of this question right now. I haven't even got to torques yet. What do you mean the force of x? What is... Right. Force, the sum of the forces in the x direction would be mass times acceleration in the extra. That's Newton's second law. So now if we're moving at a constant speed, what's the acceleration? Zero. Okay. So some of the forces coming out to be zero doesn't mean it's at rest. It means it's not accelerating. 
Now, granted, it had to have a non-zero number to get it started. So we're not talking about the initial tug here, but once you give it a tug, once you get it started, because you probably have to be a little bit more, not only to accelerate it, because you had to overcome static friction. Okay, but for both of those reasons, you probably got to pull real hard at first. But once you do, then you don't have to pull nearly as hard. Number one, you're not accelerating. Number two, you have the lower kinetic friction instead of the higher static friction. All right, so solving this in our calculator means I've got a positive 400 minus a 200 times the sine of 37. And that comes out to be about 280 newtons. So there's the magnitude of the normal force from doing the sum of the forces in the x direction. And of course, once I have that, then I guess what we're really saying then is the coefficient of friction would be the 200 times cosine of 37 divided by the normal force. So 200 times cosine of 37 uh, divided by the 280 I just calculated from the normal force gives me about a point five seven. So there's my coefficient of kinetic friction. And I don't know if you noticed, but this had nothing to do with any of the new stuff we did. This is all the way back to chapter five. I mean, this could have been a chapter five question. I mean, this was just frictional forces and normal forces. And so nothing new yet. It's part B where the tipping comes into play. And the tipping is a, is a pivot or a rotation. And so that's where, where the torques come into, come into play here. And so looking at this, it says taking a force of 300. So we're going to pull a little bit more. Instead of 200, we're going to pull 300. It says find the value of H for which the cabinet just begins to tip. In other words, what would happen if you really pulled on this thing? Besides just moving, wouldn't it start to tip? I mean, if you pulled on this thing really, really hard, I reach down here and I pull it, I mean, what's really going to happen? Instead of going across the floor, it's going gonna, it's gonna to torque, it's going to pivot. I'm going to be basically picking it up on its corner. So as I grab it, it comes off of that corner over there and it goes through a rotation instead of a translation. That's what this question is, is asking. If you do it too much force or too much torque because that can come from either too much force or you could be holding it at a different spot. And the different spot, the different heights would give you a different amount of, of torque. So let me come over here and redraw this cabinet. So here's this cabinet. Let me put the forces again and I guess I kind of ended up switching into blue so I'll do the forces in the, in the green here. But what we really have here is we've got a force this way of 400. We've got a frictional force going this way, which I don't know if we calculated the frictional force. We didn't, although between knowing the coefficient and the uh, normal force, we could find it. I don't think we need to know it. We've got a normal force pushing up, and we've got this force now, which we're saying we're going to increase it to 300. I'm going to assume they, even though they increased the force, they didn't change the direction. They didn't really say anything about the direction. So I think that's what they want and I, I don't know what else to do. We would need to know if it's the same direction. But then there is some height. But before we even try to do the math, let's say we get a good picture of this. And of course, it depends on what axis you want to talk about, but this is the one that I was kind of referring to. I think it might be good mathematically to calculate the torque around point A. Although I must admit, if you really pulled this hard, what would really happen? Wouldn't this corner stay stationary and it would pivot around there? So you might say that the real physical picture would be this, that, that it would, it would, it would pivot off this back corner up like that. But certainly another way of looking at it is if you were looking at point A, you would kind of see the cabinet then dipping down, right? 
And that's what I want you to see. Uh, look what begins to happen. If you think about the torque at A, isn't your hand pulling it? Wait. Oh, maybe I said this backwards then. So the because my hand, I guess, would be pulling it this way. Yeah, so if I pull on this, this is tending to rotate it this way, right? Well, that if you calculate around its center. Maybe that would be better. Uh, hmm. No, I like A, just mathematically. Maybe. Not saying this well. Wait. Yeah, I, I, I no, I'm, oh. but maybe that was a poor choice because we're kind of losing the physical picture here. But I still like it because it's going to be mathematically nice. Because look what happens. What what is if if my hand pulls on it? Here. Let's just say, let's say it was a different problem. I mean, let's just say this was a nail driven into here. I mean, when my hand pulls on, doesn't this tend to make it go this way? Right? What is keeping it from going the other way? Isn't this one the weight of it? What's the normal force doing? Right. Yeah, I don't like that. Because these are each pushing this way. And this is pushing back. Is it the only thing that gives yeah. torque, the, the 300 Newton force? Oh. Wait a minute. The friction is off. I guess I also went too fast, didn't I? I never finished A. Didn't they say where is the location yeah. of the normal before it tilts? Okay, my apologies here. But I guess it's the same free body diagram. And it's the same dilemma that I get, I'm hoping will, will come out here. But I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say here, if I'm saying it right, but it looks funny in this picture, but because conceptually I want to say the normal force keeps going out here. The vertical component of your force is making it rotate counterclockwise, but the horizontal is making it rotate clockwise. Yeah, maybe I should break it to how much is horizontal. And how much is vertical? Yeah, why don't I do why don't I do that? I was trying to avoid that, but I think I'm gonna be stuck with it. All right. So back to this. Oh actually before well, okay. I apologize here for this one. Let me let me, let me go back to this and let's, let's go back to hopefully the easier step before we get to the tilting. Because we found the normal force, we found the coefficient, this next step here is where is the normal force? And I was suggesting we probably do it around here at point A, but maybe not. Maybe I should go back to here. Because then, hopefully, what you kind of see here is I've got 
gravity pulling it down th this way, which is making a clockwise rotation. I got a normal force going this way, which is a counterclockwise direction. If I break those into its two components, as, as somebody pointed out here. I've got this one making it rotate in a clockwise direction, and I've got this component making it go in a counterclockwise direction. And I was trying to avoid that by putting a, a, a nice point there, but I think this is a little clearer to, to see here. So now, let's do this by saying the sum of the torques. So the sum of the torques along a z-axis. And again, we have to say about what point, but uh, I think it's going to be a little better to call that point A. But if I set this up, oh, and it makes me want to change my definition of x. Should I leave it here? Or will, can I, should I measure it from here now? Does anybody care? Yeah, I want to, I want to put x from here now, since I'm going to be doing a torque. And so what I'm really after is these, what you might call these four torques. So I've got this normal force, which is at a distance x away and has a magnitude of 280. That's the part of the problem we just did in A. So it's a distance of x, 280. Is it positive or is it negative? Yeah, I'd say it's pushing and making it go in a counterclockwise direction. So there's a positive torque. Okay, so there's my first torque. The other force here is the weight of the object. That is the 400 newtons. Uh, how far over is it? Well, if I drop it straight down, that would be the perpendicular distance, which is half of the width. The width, they said, was 60 centimeters. So I'm going to put a point three meters there. Okay, so there's the force, there's the distance. And that would be a negative torque, right? And so we've got this one making it go negative, this one making it go positive. This one's got the two pieces here, which, like I said, I, I still like this point. I didn't like how it turned out over there, but anyways. Uh, what would be nice about it is you'd get zero torque from that one and it would go away, as well as zero torque from the friction. But nonetheless, I'm not going to change it now that I've bounced around here. So I, the nice thing about that point is not only the physical picture, but the force of friction goes through that point. So how much torque do you get from friction? Yeah, zero. Um, which would have happened if you were here too and you would have got no torque from that one. But the way I've set it up now, I'm going to get a torque from each of these ones. Let me do the force in the x direction. The force in the x direction would be the 200 cosine of 37 degrees. Okay, so that's how much of the 200 is in the x direction. And its distance up is that height h. Did they uh, say the height in part A? Yeah, in part A, they say it's 0.4. So we know this is 0.4 meters. So that's the x component and then the height. And would it rotate it in a positive direction or a negative direction? I guess this would pull it in a negative direction. All right. So that's a negative. So the x component as well as the weight of gravity would be the same rotation. The normal force is stopping that. The other one that is stopping it or in a positive direction is Fy. So this would be 200 sine of 37 degrees. And so that is this amount. And its distance away, its perpendicular distance is this, here. And so that's our 60 centimeters, 0.6 meters. 
And uh, if I've done everything right here, I should get just one unknown. Should be just x, yeah. So a little arithmetic here will give me my x. So if I take a negative 0.3 times 400, subtract 0.4 times 200 times cosine of 37, add to that a 0.6 times 200 times sine of 37, I will get, well, 111 negative, Move it to this side, it's a positive 111. Divide it by 280 and I get my x. So, according to this one, it is about a 0.4. So x is 0.4 meters, okay? And so my normal force is not in the center. It is over here a little bit, okay? And I suppose in reality, it's even more complicated. It's probably a little bit of force here, 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 and all of it adds up to 280. But to save us from having to integrate the whole thing, we'll wait until our engineering 115 for, for that. But, but that's the equivalent of all that force here. And so maybe I'll make my picture a little wider here and something like, like that, okay? Now part B is the, the part that is going to say, okay, what happens now if you go too high? That is, what happens now, and I'll, maybe I'll do the same free body diagram here, is they having us increase the force to 300 and then start to go higher and higher and higher and higher and uh, maybe that was the problem I was tilting it the wrong way here but as this goes higher and higher isn't that adding more torque this way and uh, so I'm getting more torque that way more torque that way more torque that way so the normal force is hopefully then moving over this way right I get less torque, 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 less torque. And eventually, the normal force can't go any further than that, that point, right? Can't get any less. So anything more then makes it tip over. And that was the concept I was trying to get, that physical picture. Yeah. Does the normal force increase or is the total normal, does it remain the same, just, just concentrate on the point? Oh, good question. I don't know if you caught that, but he's asking, would the normal force be changing? Because I'm, I'm talking about changing its position. But could its value change? No, no, its value couldn't change because think about where the normal force came from. The normal force comes from the fact that we've got to support the weight of the cabinet. So as you pull on it with 300, higher and higher and higher, you still have the, excuse me, you still have the same amount of forces going down and so the normal force has to remain a constant. Uh, let's see if I can show that to you. I mean, basically I'm going to redo this calculation right here. And so, if we change our numbers here and redo this, I would say the sum of the forces in the x direction some of the forces in the y direction, okay? And let me just do the y direction. That's the part that had the normal force here. And so, again, putting this up here for n, normal force, as I do my forces, it's a normal force up. It is the weight of the cabinet down. It is then, uh, let's see, now that I messed up my diagram, how many forces were here? There was friction and normal, weight, and then my hand. And my hand then is the plus 300 sine of 37. So my point is that 
to answer your question, no matter where my hand touches the side of the cabinet, it is still pulling upward with this amount. Gravity is still pulling downward with that amount. So no matter what happens, then without lifting it, but just tilting it, then my normal force has got to remain the same. What happens is the position of the normal force begins to change to keep it from tipping as I grab the cabinet at different locations. So, short on time here, we better do this quick, quick calculation here, but as I move it to that side, I guess it would be a plus 400 and then minus a 300 times the sine of 37 degrees, which comes out to be a 219 newtons. Okay. Oh, is that what you mean? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's a much simpler question. Yes, much smaller value, much lower than 280 because we're pulling up more. So now, so we got a new normal force now that we're pulling it harder. But as we think about pulling it at different heights, it still, it still stays at the 219. Okay, good. All right, so with that said, now we can come back to this equation that I guess I've half erased here and say let's look at the sum of the torques along a z-axis at this point A and so I've got this this point A here and I'll go ahead and put the first torque in here like we had before that's x times the n but eventually what we're gonna do is say there's only so much value of x you can have here and you'll see it in the math here but we'll call that x we'll call that n and again this would be making it go in a positive rotation so there's your positive torque the other negative one was the weight of the cabinet the 400 the distance is 0.3 meters so that's making it go in a negative direction the other one that is making it go in a negative direction is that x component so that's 300 cosine of 37 degrees so uh, 300 cosine 37 degrees height of h and that's the variable that changes and that is the one that we said pulls it then as we pull it this way it's going to make it go in a negative direction and which was this term a moment ago and then finally the other piece the upward force the 300 sine of 37 degrees at a distance of 0.6 meters is a is a positive one but if this thing is not going to rotate it's got to come out to be zero so maybe now in the math you can see what I was trying to explain in the physics here that this one no matter where H is stays the same this one no matter where H is stays the same it is this that as H gets bigger this gets negative right uh oh did I say it backwards now because if that's got to get more negative then it's going to get more positive so as I pull it oh I did say it backwards so as I as I think of it I said it backwards again. Say, ah, thank you. Isn't that a positive? Let's see. This one's pulling it. No, negative. No. That one's pulling negative. That one's pulling positive. That one's pulling it negative. That one's pulling it positive. So as H gets bigger. No, 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 that should be my H. So that would tell me the normal force is moving this way. So unless, oh, we're out of time. Unless I see a sign error, then I'm going to set that equal to point, how wide is this thing? Point six and my normal force 219 
Hmm. I got myself tripped up there, but I, I need to restate that. Looking at the math, I would say the normal force is moving over here. Well, I guess I'm going to have to rethink this here. But I do like it setting it equal. It's either 0 or 0 0.6. So, sorry about that. And we're out of time, too. Bad timing. <laughs>